welcome to Research and Justice for All, a podcast series from Health Affairs sponsored by CBS Health. I'm your co-host, Dr. Jonay Khaldun, Chief Health Equity Officer at CBS Health. And I'm co-host, Dr. Shri Chagatur, Chief Medical Officer at CBS Health. So I'm really excited about today's show. We're going to be talking about disparities in maternal health outcomes. We know there are significant disparities uh, in that area, and we will be talking to Dr. Mary Ann Etiabet about what Merck is doing to address those disparities, and specifically the Merck for Mothers initiative. Mary Ann is the Assistant Vice President for Health Equity at Merck and leads the Merck for Mothers initiative. I'll tell you, Sheree, this is a very important topic to me. When I actually gave birth to my son several years ago, I had preventable complications and nearly lost my life, so I've certainly experienced firsthand the disparities that we're talking about today. This is also something that we're focusing on at CVS Health, um, partnering with local organizations and assuring women have appropriate access to services. So I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Janae, thank you so much for sharing your own personal experience in our interview. Uh, Marianne also shares her own personal experience, and this is unfortunately all too common. Rates of severe maternal morbidity has been increasing among all women, but when we look at women of Black, Hispanic, and Asian communities, they are consistently higher compared to white women. That's right, Shree. It's just the harsh reality and why this is such a critical conversation. So let's jump right in. Here's our interview with Dr. Marianne Etiabet. Welcome, Marianne, and thank you so much for joining us on the Research and Justice for All podcast. Thank you so much for the invitation, and I'm so excited we're having this conversation. Yes, Sri and I are really looking forward to our conversation. We're going to be talking about a really important topic today, something that you're an expert in, and that is maternal health, and specifically maternal health disparities. So let's jump right in. We like to start every interview asking our guests one question. And so that is, as you think about health equity, why is this work important to you personally? Thank you for the question, Janae. You know, I I do this work uh, because I believe everybody should have a fair and equal chance, not just to live their healthiest lives, but to realize their fullest potential. And that's irrespective of the circumstances of your birth, your sex, your race, your ethnicity, your religion, your place of birth. And I continue to do this work because to not do it means that we are losing lives and we're losing the lives of loved ones. And and this is personal. Um, You know, about 30 years ago, my sister-in-law in the advanced stages of her second pregnancy walked into a Brooklyn hospital with her husband, Um, but she, she didn't walk out. And to this day, my husband continues to ask me, Is there something that he or the family could have done differently to save her life? And that should not be a question a family member, a patient, or a loved one should have to ask. The burden of saving our mother's lives should not be placed on patients and their families. Our health system should be able to deliver for them. And you know what the tragedy of the situation is, Janae? You know, the daughter that she left behind now has an even greater chance of dying due to preventable causes during pregnancy and childbirth than her mother did a generation ago. And that same daughter in New York City has, is 8 to 12 times more likely to die during childbirth and pregnancy than the white friends that she went to school with. And, and that should not be anybody's reality. Wow. Wow. I'm so sorry to hear about the story of your family. Uh, and thank you for sharing those those statistics. This is real. These, these are people's lives. And to your point, it, these are preventable deaths. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Unfortunately, this is all too common in the country. And as we've seen most recently with data from the Centers for Disease Control, that these rates of maternal mortality have continued to rise for all races and ethnicities. But the rate has been staggering and alarming among black women. Uh, And as you mentioned, black women are much more likely to die from a pregnancy-related complication in the United States compared to other women. And when we look at our mortality rate as a country, 
uh, we have a maternal mortality rate that's worse than what we see in Russia. I was wondering if you could just, um, as you've committed your career to understanding this and addressing uh, maternal mortality, uh, health equity, could you tell us a little bit more about why this disparity exists? One, for us as a country compared to other countries, but more specifically, how we're seeing that mortality rate differing among communities in America. Thank you for the question, Sri. And, you know, you mentioned this has been a lifelong commitment of mine. And I am really honored and privileged now to be able to do this work in my current role at Merck. Uh, You know, back in 2011, our company made a $500 million commitment to helping end maternal mortality. And in 2021, reaffirmed that commitment with another $150 million uh, uh, to support efforts, not just in the United States, but around the world to help close this disparity gap. And this, you know, decade-long experience we've had doing this work, it really um, gives us, I think, um, a greater level of insight into what's happening at the front lines through all of the efforts of our partners and collaborators. Um, You know, what I would say, and I'm sure you've discussed this on your podcast before, you know, that 80-20 rule that actually 80% of the health outcomes that we see, including those in maternal health, are actually due to factors outside of the health system. Yeah, they're due to those social determinants of health. And so I think that as we look forward to actually closing the gap on disparities, we have to recognize that this has to be an all-hands-on-board approach and can't just be limited to the health sector or the healthcare ecosystem. Um, You know, we've seen data from hospitals in New York City where women who are walking into hospitals you know, with the same risk factors, um, a black woman versus a white woman, um, the, the black woman is less likely to survive. And so I think that tells you a little bit about, you know, what's that delta? And I think what we have learned is that the delta really is due to systemic racism. You know, systemic racism is a healthcare um, crisis, public health crisis, but it's also a modifiable risk factor. And so the work that we have to do has to address the impacts and the manifestations of of racism on our healthcare ecosystem. Marianne, thank you for framing the issue. And so you talked about systemic racism driving maternal mortality rates. I was wondering if you could just dive a little bit deeper into that. How is that actually um, uh, manifesting itself? Do you have some examples to bring this unfortunate fact to life? I think at its basic level, and this is what our partners and collaborators tell us, is that the healthcare system, healthcare providers are not listening to Black women when they say they're having a sign or symptom of a complication. Um, They are not being trusted um, and the response system is not activated uh, when Black women are raising concerns about their health um, or the the well-being of their pregnancy. I think we also see it in terms of access and where there may be birthing deserts and and not any facilities uh, for, uh, you know, any high-quality facilities in the area. We see this a lot in, in the rural areas of our country. I think the the other way it gets manifested is also as we think about um, tra- transportation and access to transportation to care, um, whether uh, people are able to have child care um, so that they can go to the doctors and, and, and get their follow-ups and, and, and checkups. So these are just you know, some of the, the ways that we're seeing it manifest. And I, I always think about we need to be able to walk in the shoes of the people that we are serving and understand the barriers that they face from the time they wake up in the morning till the time they get to that doctor's office. Um, You know, in medicine, you know, we have this term harm reduction. We need to also think about what we can do to, for barrier reduction. Um, And, and that is, you know, part of um, all of the efforts we have to make uh, in order to improve the health um, of everyone and reduce healthcare disparities. 
You know, thank you for for bringing that up and the role, particularly of the healthcare system and and providers. Can you tell us what exactly should doctors, nurses, other clinical providers who may be listening right now um, and not wanting to perpetuate these disparities, what what should they be be doing or doing differently, or what should the healthcare system and hospitals be doing differently? Again, I think at, at the very basic level, they should be listening to their patients, um, and they should be engaging in a relationship of trust and mutual respect. Um, I think as we think about what programs and solutions we as a society need to put in place, and and these are many of the things that um, Mark from Mothers Partners and Collaborators are doing, we need to make sure that um, all physicians and the whole ancillary uh, team uh, that's taking care of women understand what the warning signs are and are can be mobilized at a moment, um, you know, to respond uh, to those emergencies, those obstetric emergencies. You know, one of the other things that I think is really important for our listeners to understand is that the data is telling us, and this is some of the data that has come out of partnerships that Merck for Mothers has had with the CDC, that more deaths are actually happening now outside of the hospital after birthing moms have been discharged. And so it's important that at that discharge point, there is a um, exchange of information and women and their families are educated about what the warning signs are and, and when, you know, they should call 911 or when they should call their provider. Um, so that's work that, you know, we have been doing with our collaborators. But I think most importantly is we need to make sure that there are community supports and structures um, that are taking care of women in the community that are screening and asking them questions uh, about, you know, potential, uh, you know, potential adverse events or other health conditions that may arise, like mental health conditions, and that we have that community workforce uh, that is not only mobilized, but that is integrated with the healthcare workforce that we see in the traditional four walls of the hospital, and that there's communication and coordination between that. Um, you know, you ask that question, uh, I think, as a provider, and, you know, I'm, I'm a uh, no longer practice, uh, but we as providers need to meet our patients where they are. And that's both literally and and figuratively and take that extra step uh, to ask that question and meet patients where they are. You know, I I love this theme of of the workforce, right? And and what the workforce, the the healthcare workforce needs to do. What do you think the role is uh, of of workforce diversity um, when it comes to these disparities? And also, can you touch on when you talk about community supports, the role of doulas um, in advancing maternal health uh, improved outcomes? So, Janae, we talked earlier about how important trust is. And I don't think we can underestimate the impact of previous trauma, whether it's personal trauma or family trauma, um, that uh, informs, you know, how people engage with our healthcare system. And so the community workforce is critical. And the community workforce that understands the lived experiences of the clients that they're serving is going to be a more effective partner uh, in the healthcare journey. And so what we've been doing at Merck for Mothers uh, through one of our most recent health initiatives called the Safer Childbirth Cities is supporting uh, coalitions of organizations, many of these led by women of color with lived experiences, to work on solutions, you know, that are coming out of the community. I think the other thing we found is, you know, this, this work you know, has been happening over decades. Uh, Communities have been taking care of themselves. There are assets and strengths in the communities that we know nothing about. Our role is to help surface them, elevate them, amplify them, and support them. And doulas are just, you know, one example of um, a critical community healthcare, uh, you know, healthcare partner. Uh, I want to share one, one story. Um, we were able to visit um, the client of one of our partners in Philadelphia. 
Uh, this was a woman who had a doula support her uh, throughout her pregnancy, who served as not just a coach, but an advocate for her when she was interfacing and engaging with the healthcare system. And as we left that woman's home, you know, I kind of asked her, I was like, you know, what's, what's next, you know, what's next for you? And, you know, she poked her head out the door and shyly said, you know, I want to be a doula. You know, I, I had such an amazing experience with my doula. She helped me so much. I want to be able to give that back to my community. And so I think from these types of examples, we can see what the ripple effect of investing in people is. Um, and, you know, uh, again, how do we build up community assets and strengths? And, and how do we, as a private sector company, uh, you know, be, be part of that movement? Marianne, uh, you mentioned about this uh, visit that you've had and um, what a powerful story about your uh, an individual's lived experience informing their future trajectory. But I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about Merck as an organization and then uh, more about Merck for Mothers in particular, which is an important initiative the organization has to advance maternal mortality equity. So let me just turn it back over to you to tell us a little bit more. I love talking about Merck for Mothers. As I said, I'm, I'm so honored, you know, to be able to uh, lead the team in this work. Uh, Merck, as you know, you may know, is, you know, one of the leading pharmaceutical companies uh, in, in the country. And I think we have decades legacy, you know, of running towards uh, the, the world's most challenging uh, health problems and, and maternal mortality is no different. Um, if you look at our history, you'll see that that there have been commitments to health equity across the decades, whether it's our Mechtizan donation program, where we've committed to ensuring that the solution for river blindness uh, will be available for as long as it's needed uh, at no cost. Um, Merck for Mothers was created back in 2011 when we saw, um, our leadership at the time saw, that the maternal mortality rates, as you mentioned earlier in the podcast, were actually going in the wrong direction in the United States. Um, and as one of the richest countries, if not the richest country in the world, um, that should not be the case. And so could a private sector partner bring something different to the table that had that had been missing thus far? And thus, you know, Merck for Mothers was was born. Um, I mentioned, you know, we've committed $650 million uh, to this cause since 2011. Um, we have had partnerships in over 65 countries. We have four focus countries. The United States is one of them uh, because as we've talked about, the, the alarming um, increase that we're seeing in the rates, as well as the alarming increases in the disparities. And, you know, how we work um, is to partner uh, with the folks that are doing the hard work on the front lines. Um, one of the things that we started off doing was making sure that there was the data um, that would not only tell us what the problem was and where the problem existed, but what the impactful solutions would be. And we're proud that that initial investment in the data um, is what is really driving everyone to action. Because when you see those numbers in your face, um, uh, up front and stark, you can't ignore them. Um, and the fact that we are now not just counting every death, but investigating it and making sure that they are efforts to prevent that next death um, is something that was not the norm in every state of this country 11 years ago. Um, the other way we partner um, is to improve the quality of care in facilities. Um, Shri, I've, I've heard you talk before about responding to a cardiac code. And, you know, as medical students and, and residents and trainees, uh, you know, we do those practices, you know, every, every week. Um, it becomes ingrained in how we, you know, respond, you know, to a cardiac code. That should be the same for an obstetric emergency. Um, teams should be mobilized immediately and, and know how to respond and work together uh, for that. And so some of the investments we've made over the years has been to develop and implement these safety bundles and make sure that they are scaled uh, throughout hospitals um, in the country. And we're really proud that, you know, through partnerships, um, we, you know, we are getting to goal uh, for that objective. 
The other way we partner, um, you've heard the saying, knowledge is power, um, is making sure that this information gets out to everybody who needs it, uh, birthing people and their families, so that they know what questions to ask and they can hold their providers accountable. Uh, and then the last way we partner is to support community-based solutions like the Safer Childbirth Cities Initiative that I mentioned. I love that. So data and collecting that data so we know where we are, driving improvements in the quality of care, knowledge sharing, supporting communities and community-based care. I, I think those four pillars, if I have them right, are just incredibly powerful pillars to drive this uh, important work forward. And I'm wondering if you have a couple of successes that you're incredibly proud of that you've seen with your partners uh, or some particular innovations that you're really excited about that are coming down the pike that could help us in addressing this important issue. You know, for me, the thing that actually makes me proudest is the way that we are changing norms um, in the healthcare system. Um, I think when I started this work, um, it was not the norm or it was not the expectation that uh, people with lived experiences or people in the communities uh, would be part of the maternal mortality review committees that are happening at the state or at the hospital level. Um, very proud that we are able to support um, community serving organizations that are led uh, by people with lived experiences. But, you know, you ask a tough question, Shri, and this is a question that, you know, our team constantly asked ourselves is, are we moving the needle with our work? And, you know, you will know that sometimes it takes a while, you know, to see population health impact, um, uh, you know, for, for many of, of these conditions, including maternal health outcomes. So what's the data that we can look at that are leading indicators that, that we are moving the needle. Uh, and I think uh, when we look at things like, uh, you know, all of the hospitals that are now implementing safety bundles, and we've seen that states that have done that, whether it's California, New York, or now New Jersey, we do see, um, you know, their state level statistics uh, improve. Um, so those are, you know, some of the things uh, that, that we're proud of. Marianne, you mentioned safety bundles as an important driver. I wonder if for our listeners, if you could talk a little bit more about what is a safety bundle and how does that improve uh, care? Great, great question. You know, a safety bundle is a combination of interventions and processes and practices um, that provide the highest quality care in response uh, to an obstetric emergency. Um, so, for example, if a woman is bleeding um, and reports, you know, that she is bleeding and she's bleeding more than usual, um, immediately the care team should be mobilized to respond to that. Um, and, uh, you know, this is something that hospitals are holding their teams uh, accountable for. Um, you know, we've, when we hear, you know, some of these high profile deaths that are happening, you know, again, the lesion has been that teams are not responding and mobilizing quickly and effectively uh, to the complaints, um, uh, you know, uh, to the complaints of, of patients. So, you know, that's important. It's important that teams practice that response, you know, because uh, if it doesn't happen very often, uh, you know, we know that practice makes perfect and, and every second, every minute counts. Um, we have supported the development and implementation of safety bundles for, you know, the, the top, um, you know, the, the top killers, uh, you know, of birthing mothers. So whether that be postpartum hemorrhage, preeclampsia, eclampsia, pulmonary embolism. But, you know, what's really interesting, Shri, as we've done this work is, you know, when we first started it, you know, we brought all the experts around the table, you know, and, and unfortunately at that time, people's imagining of experts were, you know, the subject matter experts, the clinicians, you know, the folks with the fancy degrees. Um, as we've done that work, we've realized that context experts need to be included in how safety bundles are developed. And safety bundles should include inputs of patients who have had those lived experiences. 
And actually, we should have safety bundles that include things that are happening in the communities and that integrate, you know, um, anti-racist practices and and processes, uh, you know, as as part of that safety bundle. So the safety bundles continue to evolve um, as we continue to push for a more inclusive, um, you know, more inclusive practices and processes, uh, you know, to, to solve for these consistent and persistent and pervasive challenges. You know, I love that, Marianne. You're really talking about changing a system of care, right? Changing our system, making sure the community has input into what that system looks like. But I wanted to talk a little bit more about the global work that you do. As, as we've already noted, it's not because the United States ha- doesn't have enough resources and, and money or fancy degrees, to your point. Um, that's not the cause for the disparities that we see. Can you tell us a little bit more about the differences in how the United States uh, healthcare system addresses maternal health compared to some other countries? And then are there specific policies that you think would potentially help us move the needle here in the United States when it comes to maternal health disparities? So I'd, I'd like to answer that question in at least three parts. You know, one is to be able to share, you know, some of the similarities of the challenges. You know, we talked earlier about the social determinants of health. Um, if a woman cannot get to a high quality facility in time, that's a risk. You know, in New York City, that may be a metro card. Um, in Nigeria, the land of my birth, that may be building a road, you know, or, or, or finding a boat. So, you know, the solutions are different, but really the, the, the problems and the challenges come from the same root. Uh, you know, I think the other thing I would say about our global work, and it's, it was really interesting to see um, a really seminal UNFPA report uh, being released a couple of weeks ago, Um, that saw the um, impact of systemic racism across the Americas. And so when we think about our global work, um, the inequities that we see both between countries are actually the same types of inequities that are um, that we see reflected within countries. And a lot of that, the, the root is, is, you know, in the legacy of slavery, in the legacy of, of colonialism. And that is some of the work also that Merck for Mothers is trying to do. We want to think about um, how we can be a different type of partner. Um, you know, not just think of ourselves as philanthropy, as funders, but actually think of ourselves as investors um, and co-creators, co-solution makers, you know, uh, co-wafers. Uh, because at the end of the day, and this is something, you know, we talk about as a team every day, if the impact of the work that we do, the work that we partner around, the support that we give is not sustained after we, you know, the project of the program is finished, and um, that was for naught. And to your point, we, we didn't help catalyze, you know, the transformation, you know, of the system so that it can continue to deliver for women. Thank you so much for that. And also for pointing out how important it is to get very local when it comes to understanding the challenges and then also developing the solutions. So thank you so much, Marianne, for joining us on our podcast today. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Marianne. It really was a pleasure. That was such a great conversation. It's really impressive how much Marianne and her team have really focused on addressing maternal health disparities, not just in the United States, but really across the globe. And I really appreciate the fact that she talked about the importance of including people with lived experience and really addressing those systems of care and listening to a woman and making sure that their their stories and, and their needs are really incorporated into the care that they receive. Absolutely. And when Marianne talked about Merck for Mothers and their four pillars for work, it was incredibly practical and helped advance the uh, cause of improving maternal mortality equity. And she talked about the role of data, improving quality of care with a real deep dive into safety bundles, which I found very helpful, knowledge sharing and supporting communities. And those four pillars really are driving the success of the initiatives. That's right. Such an important conversation. That is our show for today. Thank you so much for joining us on the Research and Justice for All podcast sponsored by CVS Health. I'm Dr. Jonay Keldoon. And I'm Dr. Sheree Chagaturu. 
So please share this podcast with anyone you know who's working to advance health equity. And don't forget to subscribe to the Research and Justice for All podcast if you haven't already. Thank you for listening. Until next time, take care, everyone. Research and Justice for All is produced by Health Affairs. This season is sponsored by CVS Health. If you enjoyed this episode, the best thing you could do is share it with a friend or a colleague. It helps people find the show. Thanks for listening, and be sure to check out Health Affairs' other podcasts, A Health Policy and Health Affairs This Week. Health Affairs, where health policy advances.